So today we're going to be looking at John the Baptist, and we are doing a character study on uh, John. So typically the reasons why we do character studies is they provide us with a good or sometimes a bad example of a single or multiple characteristics. And so in the case of a bad example, it might be a, a fatal flaw that they had, something that, that was their undoing. We compare the kings, for example, Saul and David. Saul has many examples of what not to do is willful stubbornness. David, of course, would be multiple character studies that we could make of, of him. John the Baptist is a great example for us in many ways. Uh, and just as a bit of a background, he was uh, a cousin of Jesus. You can read the complete background story of him. We're not going to be going through it in its entirety in the Gospel of Luke, about the events that accompanied his birth. And uh, Luke also provides some details that Matthew doesn't provide and John doesn't provide on the circumstances surrounding our, our Lord's birth as well. I do want us to focus, though, on um, Gabriel's statements to Zacharias, which is John's father, concerning John in verses 14 to 17. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, that is John's birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall neither... Uh, and shall neither uh, drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's wombs, womb. And this is the important part about it. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, that is Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to, quote, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John is actually about six months older than Jesus, is his cousin, his mission is listed for us. Now one might ask, can we learn from one whose mission is so great? We might think, well, that's quite the task that John's been assigned. How can we possibly relate? Well, we're going to look at that. We're going to notice that Yes, what John does and what we do, there are a lot of similarities. And John struggled with some of the same problems that we struggle uh, with. So there are many things that we can learn from John the Baptist. And sometimes we say, we have that song that we sing, Dare to be a Daniel. Well, there's something that John, we can learn from him here. And that is dare to be first. Dare to stick out like a sore thumb, so to speak. Um, when we're first introduced to John as an adult, he's already begun his life's work, which is preaching a message of repentance in fulfillment of two prophecies, uh, one in Isaiah and one in Malachi. So if we go to the statements in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 through 3, I forgot to mention that just as a reminder, this is a in accordance with the announcement that uh, William made a little while ago, this is uh, still a lecture style uh, sort of sort of uh, lesson. So if you have any questions or, or comments, uh, you can approach me later or you can phone or email me at, at a later time. <clears throat> but we go to Matthew chapter 3 in verse 1 to 3. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his way straight. You can see that he is uh, now fulfilling, and he as well would be about 30 at this time, fulfilling the very thing that Gabriel said that he would be doing uh, by prophecy at his birth. Mark very similar, but gives us the other prophecy, the one uh, largely in, in Malachi. It's a little bit of a conflation of the text here between Isaiah and Malachi. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is the very beginning of Mark's 
uh, gospel. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make the way of the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. These are both uh, dovetail with the final prophecy, which we uh, can look at. Oh, that's Micah, not Malachi. I'm wondering. I, was like, I don't remember Malachi having seven chapters. That's because it doesn't. Uh, Mike, uh, Malachi in chapter four, the very end, the conclusion of it, the prophet writes, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in, in Horeb, that is Sinai for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now this Elijah, of course, is not a, a, a literal Elijah coming back in, in not the actual person of Elijah, nor is it Elijah being reincarnated or something like that. It's just the nature of John and his gospel parallels very closely in its nature with what Elijah's work was. And that was, of course, to turn people's hearts towards God. He was to prepare the way for Jesus's coming. This is quite the monumental task when you think about it. John's role was very similar to uh, well if you think about a you think about royalty and they often have before they enter a place they have someone precede them and then say the king is about to appear or you have someone with a trumpet that makes it obvious that someone of greatness or royalty is approaching John is like that in that regard John is like is like a gardener that removes weeds and stones in preparation for seeds being planted. That is very similar to what his role of repentance is. There is a great one coming, but the people aren't ready to hear his message because the people aren't focused on the things of the Lord. There are weeds and stones in their life. And John's message is to get them to repent. Repent for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our role is very similar. We live in an age where the thing that is most commonly keeping people from God, and it always has been, is sin in their life. Now, it could be personal immorality, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. It could be the pride of life. It could be doctrinal sin. We won't often think about that, but God says, those that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. We have a lot of people that are worshiping God in what they think is the right spirit, but they're worshiping God in truth. And it's hard for people to hear that is sin, and yet it is. And so we have a lot of religiously sincere individuals. And if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you will see that Jesus is preaching to an audience. I don't think there is any Gentiles there. There's no indication that there was any Gentiles there, a completely Jewish audience all of whom thought that they were religious, and yet Jesus at one point blatantly calls them evil. But you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, so your Father in heaven knows how to give good gifts to you, or how much more the Father knows how to give good gifts to you. Our duty then is to not only preach the gospel, but to help identify those stones and weeds that are in people's lives, and to help them remove it, so that thing that is holding them back from serving God, the arms of the Lord is not short, but your sins have separated, that he cannot save, but your sins have separated you from your God, that they can enter into a relationship with the Lord like that. But they're not ready unless they repent. It's not something easy message for people to hear. It wasn't an easy message, I think, for John to preach either, and we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more in a future part of our lesson. But it's hard to be first sometimes, isn't it? That was John. That was what John was doing. He was the first one in a long time to go to the people and to preach that message. There hadn't been a prophet since Malachi. 
And of course, Jesus can be considered a prophet as well. But for those that just try to put Jesus into the category of prophet, he, of course, is so much more than just a prophet. It's hard to take a stand for something and to be the first to speak out in it. We want to be in our comfort zone. Uh, and that's normal, that's natural, but as Christians, we don't often have the luxury to be in our comfort zone. We have, and, and, and uh, John and William both held up that little sign about opportunity plus ability equals responsibility. If we have the ability to do something and we have the opportunity to do something, we have the responsibility to teach the gospel. Here in Canada, and especially here in Kingston, we are a relatively small group. On an individual basis, we may be the only person who is available to teach somebody the gospel. And so sometimes we might recognize a scenario, and I don't know how many times I've done that. We've talked about this a couple of weeks ago as well, where somebody and I have been talking, and I was like, wow, I think somebody really needs to teach them on that subject. And... You know, and then you go about your daily business and then realize, wait a minute, I'm probably the only person who could teach them about that subject. I'm the only person who is available to. That somebody should have been me. But that is hard because maybe they've never heard the gospel in its entirety. And so we have that natural sense of, oh, maybe there'll be a better opportunity uh, where it will be easier. Or maybe it'll... Um, Maybe somebody else will get to them, or, or this relationship is going really well. I don't want to rock the proverbial boat with this, and then that might ruin it for them entirely. We're not soil judges. Our responsibility is to make sure that we teach the message. We're not responsible for how people, if they respond negatively. Yes, sometimes there might be a better time, but at the same time, that might be the only time. And so at the very least, we need to be, as Paul says, buying up our opportunities, maximizing the most of our time, because it may be that we would never have another opportunity with that individual again. And I fully acknowledge that that can be quite difficult. It takes evidence. It takes uh, dedication, I should say, not evidence, dedication. There is a amount of, and this might seem like an odd statement, but being first, there is an amount of glory and recognition that comes from God with that. And one might think that's a strange statement to make. We don't, when we think about our serving the Lord, we don't think about seeking personal glory for ourselves. We want to point towards God. But have you ever stopped to consider though, that we are seeking after glory? Not personal glory though. John talks about those that that were, would, would, would uh, not speak up for Jesus because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. But does that not teach us then that the proper order should be that our first and foremost thing should love to be praised from God and then from men? It's not bad being praised from, from men, but it has to be in, but we have to have our priority being a praise from God. Um, Paul in Romans chapter 2 talks about those eternal life, uh, well, let's go to John, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 6, talking about God who will render to each according to his deed, eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immor immortality. So those are individuals that are seeking for glory, but it's glory from God, not glory from man, not glory for themselves, but from God and honor. Jesus echoes that statement when he says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 11, and we'll see the type of confession that John has from the Lord. And this is, keep in mind that when we are being first, this might help us to be a little bit more motivated when we realize that by having that courage to go first, the Lord approves of us doing that. The Lord looks upon us favorably when we have that courage to stand up first. We're going to, of course, be running back to this text for the first part of it. But in Matthew chapter 11 and verse uh, 7, you know, there's a parallel. It says, as the departed Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? 
Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent takes it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. Now imagine having this. This, this is said of John. His work is being praised by the Lord. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not been risen one greater than John the Baptist. Imagine the Lord saying something like that to us. Well, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. If we do the Lord's will, that is what the Lord will say about us. He will praise our work. We will have the treasure in heaven. So sometimes I think when we are in that situation where we are maybe the only person that can invite someone out to a Bible study or teach them, I think rather than framing it in a negative sense of focusing on my fears that I need to overcome, my, my uh, trepidations or whatever, put it in a positive sense of if I do this, this is something that the Lord is going to be very pleased that I, I'm going to be doing the Lord's will and he is going to be he is going to be um, rewarding me for for that. Um, sometimes if we put things in a positive light instead of a negative light, that's a little bit better. We'll go to the next one. Leading a distraction-free life. Now you go ahead and look and, and look at look at John's life here. He says, now John. In, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 6, was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And as it, so his diet was very simple. He ate the same thing pretty much all the time, and his clothes were quite simple. Jesus talks about that in that statement that we just read. Did, what did you go out to see, a man in soft clothing? In other words, luxuriously dressed? No, if you were looking for that, you would have gone to see Herod, or you would have gone to see Pontius Pilate, you would have gone to see one of the kings or governors to do that. That's not what John was about. <clears throat> this is also reflected, this simplicity of life is reflected in John's preaching. And I think it goes, to, John, if he's preaching about this, it shows us that this must have been a big problem in Jesus' day. And this is a problem, actually, that's still a big problem, I think, even more so than in John's day, in our day. And go ahead and read what he has to say to the various groups in Luke chapter 3 and verse 7 to 14. This gives us, Luke gives us more of an indication of the specifics of what he's calling people to repent of. Then he said to the multitudes that came to him to be baptized by him, brood of vipers who, is, who warned you to flee from the wrath of, to come, that's partly directed at the Pharisees. We see that in Matthew's uh, version of this. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say of yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear down good fruit, does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Be content with what you have and do not be greedy for extra gain are two of the three things that he says, one to the tax collector and one to the soldiers. And then with what we do have, let's not continually accumulate more than we need, but use those to help others as a blessing for others. 
if John's preaching about this, this must have been something that they struggled with in his time. And I, it, it's, it's uh, uh, almost tedious to make the point that, that we have that same problem in our society as well, especially in, in North America. And that was, and his life was reflected in this. So when you look back at the way it says that he was uh, dressed in Mark chapter 1, you see that he is living the way that he preaches. He has that simple tunic and he eats simple things. Now, two things about that. One, it means that, and of course, this goes without saying, that what we are teaching others to do and pointing towards, we need to make sure that we are doing ourselves. But we're not saying that we have to go out. I'm not saying that we should all go out and, and live as simply as what John lived with a diet that's just locust and wild honey or its modern equivalent. What John has done here, though, is he has removed himself from distractions, both in the people that he surrounded himself with because he was largely alone, and in the simplicity of the life that he led. And he removed those distractions from his life so that he could focus on the work that God had sent him to do. Now, we have work that God has sent us to do. In general, it is to preach the gospel and to teach the gospel in as much as our roles within the church can allow us to do. And we see that we have been redeemed, that we uh, God has prepared work beforehand, that we might walk in it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, I believe. I'm probably off by one verse as I usually am when I quote, when I quote verses. But we have work to do as well. So let me ask you, what are your distractions? I think you know what they are. I don't think you have to think about them too, too long. I can name my top three, and I'm not going to share them, but I can name my top three distractions right off the top of my head. That if I'm going to be uh, neglecting prayer or neglecting Bible study or neglecting opportunities to share the gospel, I know the three things that I'm going to be wasting my time with but the most likely three things I'm going to be wasting my time with if I'm shirking my duties, as, as they say. Here is the question, and here's the challenge. Are you willing to remove them so you can serve the Lord more effectively? And what are you willing to do to remove them? Uh, for some, it might be quite simple, just a simple dedication uh, right here and now amongst yourselves to say, I'm going to try to, and we'll just use a simple one, I'm going to try to, to watch less TV. I, I know, or I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure that I've studied a certain number, certain amount of my Bible and said my prayers before I ever turn that television on. Sometimes that's a good way to do things. Put our priorities first. Just like we say to, say to children, do your homework and then you can go ahead and you can watch your show or you can go over to, to Billy's place and and, and play tag with Billy or whatever. Or we say, eat your vegetables first and you can have your dessert. Now, the Lord's work should not be torturous to us, but some we need to make sure that we are putting first things first. But if it is that those things in our life are such a distraction that we can't reduce the amount of time, and when I mention distractions, I'm talking about things that are not inherently sinful but are things that are taking up more time in our lives than they should be. So there are shows that we could watch. There are books that we could read. There are friends we could spend time with. There are events that we can go to that are not uh, sinful. If they are, those need to be 100% removed. I'm talking about the ones, though, that we could be watching or involving ourselves with that are themselves uh, fairly decent or clean or wholesome, but we are letting them get in the way of serving our, our, the Lord or hobbies that we like to spend too much time with. If it is that we cannot remove ourselves from that, are fully incapable of doing so, then we need to just remove that entirely from our lives. Maybe there'll come a time in the future when we can reintroduce that into our lives, but we need to, as John did here, remove distractions so that we are serving the Lord more effectively.
This is a hard one. Telling people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. John did this with two groups. Matthew chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. It says, in Jerusalem, all Judea around the Jordan went out to him. And all the region around the Jordan went out to him and they were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So there was a good positive group that responded. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee for the wrath to come? Therefore bear worthy fruits worthy of repentance and do not think to say to yourselves, and we've already read the verse about Abraham. Nobody challenges the Pharisees and the Sadducees and gets away with it. They are the group that is in control. They are the religious teachers. We know, and I think you know, for time's sake, we're not going to read that second passage there in its entirety. You know, of course, that Herod was the one um, that got John killed. It was at the request of somebody else, but it was ultimately Herod that said that fulfilled the order and had John's head brought to him on a platter. I posit to you, though, that if Herod didn't get to him, given the fact that they killed Jesus, they probably would have likely gotten to John, and probably before they got to Jesus. John, based on who he was preaching to, was going to have a life of persecution, most likely leading to death. Now, as if teaching and preaching against the practices of the religious leaders of the day is not difficult enough, John angers a king. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 18 to 20, and this isn't the only place where you can find it, he says, and with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. So first he locked him up in prison, and then we're not going to read the full account in Matthew chapter 14 for time's sake, but eventually he has him killed. His head is brought to him on a silver, silver platter because of a silly oath that Herod made. <clears throat> He was telling Herod that that wife that you have right there, you shouldn't have. Now, if people are sensitive about anything, they are very sensitive about divorce, uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They are very incredibly sensitive about that subject. We see as well that in this version that there's not just that that Herod had done, but others. And he is preaching about this and people are hearing this and Herod, he's embarrassed. Nobody embarrasses a king typically and gets away with it. Now, it's unlikely that we are going to suffer to the same degree that John did. It's unlikely that we are to be thrown in prison in this day and age, and it's very unlikely that we are to be decapitated. It's not without the realm of impossibility, but it's unlikely. Most likely what we are going to be is mocked, uh, since probably the next most thing up there might be threatened with legal action, fined or sued, maybe leading up to prison time, but most likely we are just outright ignored or mocked. <clears throat> Some might get mad enough to maybe take a swing at somebody. I, I think I've heard a couple of stories where that has kind of kind of happened, where a person was harassed. But to the level of John, no. We can take a little bit of heart from that, but regardless... We have the obligation to teach God's word in, in, in its entirety. As an expression that D. Bowman used to use, probably still does use it, I liked it, and we hang the consequences is what he would, he would say. Don't be concerned about the consequences. Now, that's, that's oftentimes what we base things on in our mind. We start with the consequences and work back from there and try to go with the path of least resistance. And again, just like being in our comfort zone, I think that's something that is relatively normal for people as their default positions. But as Christians, we have to make sure that whatever it is that's holding people back from God, we have to be the ones to say it to them and hang the consequences. 
this matches nicely with being the first because in, in Canada, I think for a lot of people we meet, that is the case that telling people what they need to hear and being, being courageous enough to be the first to tell them that often are the same things. A couple of, a couple of things and we might make this point a little bit short for times for time's sake is don't let ego get in the way of the work. We have to be willing to share the work and to work with others. John had a large audience. We saw about all the region of Judea. We see in John chapter one and verse 35 that he had followers. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, it says. And John's preaching was influential enough that there was actually those that even after the gospel had been proclaimed and the apostles were going around, that there were individuals who had been um, baptized in the baptism of John and Apollos were introduced. He was preaching a message of repentance like John was. And he wasn't in the Jerusalem area. He was all the way in uh, Corinth? Corinth, yes, that's right. He was all the way in Corinth. So that message had gotten quite the distance. Uh, so John had a lot of followers, but his mission wasn't to accumulate followers for himself. His mission was to point people to Jesus. And we see that in John chapter 1, verse 29, he says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, referencing something he said earlier in the chapter, after me who comes a man who is preferred before me or greater than me, for he was before me. Now they must have been a little confused about that statement because John is older physically than Jesus by a few months. But he is, just like that statement before Abraham I was, giving them a little bit of a hint about who Jesus is. But he's willing to lose disciples to Jesus. It says in verse 37 that we just referenced before, after he said, behold the Lamb of God, those two disciples heard John speak, and they go and follow Jesus. And there's nothing in the text to indicate that John the Baptist tried to hold them back. He says, hey guys, what are you doing? No, 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 you're followers of me, not Jesus. He can get his own followers later on, but you guys stick with me. Nothing of that nature that John was doing. He didn't let the ego determinant. We see another example of that very quickly in, in John chapter 20, John chapter 3. It says there that there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, Jesus, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing and all coming to him. So his disciples didn't quite get it. He had told them about Jesus, but some of them were turning, trying to turn it into a certain thing. John says, no, Jesus is greater than me. He repeats what he said before, and in verse 30, he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, the exact parallel to our work isn't necessarily the same, but we need to not make sure that we aren't getting ego in the way of the Lord's work if we are doing something and somebody else can participate, somebody else can help, somebody else can do something. We need to not necessarily be trying to hoard it all to ourselves. We need to always be thinking of what's best for the work of the church and the work of the Lord. And obviously we want to always be thinking of what I can do the most to help. But if we are making it into something that's about us, then we need to be considering John the Baptist and his role in, in letting go and the willingness to let go. And our final point about John is this, and I think this is one of the areas in which we can relate the most to John, is in here we've seen so far this paragon of faith and, and there's really nothing that we can say about John that's negative. But here he has a lapse that we read of. And I want you to keep in mind that this is after he's been in prison for a while. Turn to Luke chapter 7. And starting in verse 18. It says, And the disciples of John reported to Jesus concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to him. Oh, sorry. 
Then disciples of John reported to John concerning all these things. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come, come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent to us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour, Jesus cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. This is the same man that we just read about in our, the last slide that we were looking at that said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew who Jesus was, and that was a full confession of his, of his faith. And yet here we see that same man after he's been in prison and down for a while. He is, he is the one that is saying, are you the coming one? Are you the Christ? He got discouraged. He got down. Now I want to make a few points about this, and then the lesson will be yours. First of all, John was lucky enough to have friends here, wasn't he? I think with this passage, we often overlook two, two important individuals, and those are the ones that were from John, that went to Jesus, talked to Jesus, saw what Jesus was doing, because Jesus showed them all of these miracles, and, and not like for Herod, because he wanted to see one, but so that they could see personally that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy, and go to John and say, we talked to Jesus, and this is what he has to say, but we are able to testify to you. We've seen, we've heard the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. The other thing I want to point out is John did the appropriate thing here. When he started having doubts, he asked and he approached the Lord. I think this is one of a good example of what Peter says about cast your cares on him for he cares for you. John could have just stewed in his doubt, and maybe he could have gotten bitter and angry about being in prison, and he could have said it was all for naught. I, I maybe was deceived. But instead, he goes, Lord, I'm discouraged, and I have doubt. Now, by the way, and this applies to us just as well, you're not saying anything that is going to surprise God. He already knows. Nine-tenths of, conf of, of confessing doubts in prayer is getting ourselves to admit that we have a problem that needs to be addressed. It's about us being humble enough to approach the Lord and saying, I need help with this. There is nothing that we can say to God in prayer about what we are feeling or thinking that is going to shock or surprise him. And so John did the right thing here. Faith, and it's very easy to get discouraged during difficult times, typically is a journey, and it's got its mountains and its valleys. Now, if we are growing in the Lord, despite the mountains and the valleys, it's doing, it's doing this. It's growing. But take two lessons from John here, and I'll encourage you. Make sure that when you are discouraged, you are seeking out friends like John did to help encourage you and turn to them and use them. And if you are in a situation to be that friend to somebody, be that friend, because I can guarantee you that you're going to need a friend some point in your life in a similar way. And do approach the Lord with those concerns. As I've said, he's not going to be surprised by anything we say. So by way of summary, this morning we've gone ahead and we've looked at John the Baptist. And I have uh, brought to your attention and, and challenged you again to dare to be the first in making sure that what we say to individuals are what they need to hear and help to be brave enough to point out the things that they need to be doing in their life to overcome and overcome those fears and be courageous. To challenge ourselves 
to identify and remove distractions from our life. And to be honest with ourselves that when we are having doubts to both seek out friends, not isolate ourselves, and to bring our concerns to the Lord and not try to deal with things 100% ourselves. John is our example, a good example, a good brother in this regard for those things, and a good example we can learn from in this regard to help improve our faith.